Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Today, we are honored to be sitting down and chatting with the town of Tilsonburg, Ontario, Councillor Kelly Spencer. Tilsonburg is nestled in the heart of southwestern Ontario and is a charming and vibrant town that seamlessly combines a rich agricultural heritage with modern amenities. With a population of around 16,000 residents, Tilsonburg offers a welcoming and tight-knit community atmospheres that appeals to both locals and visitors alike. Known as the friendly town, Tilsonburg is renowned for its warm hospitality and strong sense of community. The town's history dates back to the 1820s when European settlers, mainly of German and Irish descent, established the area. Now, over the years, Tilsonburg evolved into a prosperous agricultural hub, and today it remains deeply connected to the farming roots. This is Cross Border Interviews with Councillor Kelly Spencer. Councillor, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start at the beginning, the beginning of who Kelly is. And to do that, I've got to ask, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Kelly? Um, I definitely have influence from my father, who um, had passed away uh, years ago, but um, he was president of the Tilsonburg Hospital. But beyond that, and I'll be quite honest, it was when we were doing his obit that I learned how much he was involved in this town. So he was on the Economic Development Committee. He was on the Affordable Housing Committee. He was a Shriner. He was like, you know, working at the uh, president of the curling club, the golf club. He, he was just so involved, as was my mother, in volunteer roles um, that he really instilled in me to be a, a community player. And so um, I've always done those sorts of things, lots of volunteering, lots of committees and that sort of thing. So where did the political bug come from? Because it sounds like uh, getting involved locally could have been through many different avenues for you. You could have taken your father's path with being volunteerism, but you chose in 2022 or even 2021, I'm not sure when you decided to officially put your name on the ballot, that you were going to put your name on the ballot. What was that decision based on and where did your political sort of instincts come from? Well, I, I think I'm naturally... Um a critical thinker and opinionated at the same time. Um, I was a registered nurse for a lot of years. And um, so I, I think that I've, um, that part is a, a part of who I am. How did I get to municipality or municipal uh, politics? Um, I would, if you had asked me in 2021, if I would be a politician in 2022, I would have said you're bat crazy. Um, <laughs> That's just not something that was on my radar. And I'll be quite forthcoming. I had a couple uh, people come to, to me, to my business, um, knowing, uh, and my business had won community uh, service awards. Uh, so I was known in the community. Um, and, and one of them was a mayor, an ex-mayor. He wasn't a current mayor, but from many years ago. And he said, this town needs you. Have you considered running? And I'm like, no. And uh, then somebody else said it. I'm like, oh, this. I, and then I, I think I watched um, like an <laughs> online YouTube of one of the council meetings. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is dry, man. This is a dry conversation. Um, but then the more I started looking into it, the more I really felt that of all the maybe poli political tears there could be, this is the one that fit it fit well with me because I am a community driven person and I do like to participate in, in the town's decisions or changes. And so I, uh, I just went, okay, fine. I'll do it. <laughs> is that, is that honestly what it came down to is you just waking up one day and saying, okay, let's just do it. Okay. Let's see. I, well, I sat on it. Like, like I had, um, you know, like, I had no clue, one, what it involved. Um, and I had a couple people ask me to uh, consider it. And um, literally the first time somebody said it to me, I'm like, absolutely not, <laughs> absolutely not. And then the second person, so then I started kind of looking at it 
And as, um, you know, witchy woo as it might sound, I am a mindfulness uh, teacher and uh, specialist and I do talks on mindfulness and I just meditated on it. And I, I came to that conclusion like, yeah, okay, I, I'm going to do it. Okay, so this opens up a range of questions I was not prepared to ask, but I, I love it already because I get to ask these questions. For someone who wasn't a political observer, a self-described political observer, because you watched one council meeting and you said, dear God, this is dry. Yeah. What has been the biggest eye-opening experience for yourself now looking back 15 months almost, being first elected in November of 2022 to when we're recording this in January of 2024? What's been the biggest aha moment for yourself in the role of a municipal councillor? Mm, there's been a few. <laughs> it's been a while. It's been a bit of a wild ride for me, um, uh, admittedly. Um, uh, one, how much I didn't know about my town. <laughs> of uh, all the inner workings and how it worked, how much the corporation of our town did. Um, the, uh, how the tier system worked, like we're a tier, a two tier system. Uh, so we have Oxford County as our, as our other tier. Um, the connections who, you know, I had to learn it all, like who was responsible for what. And so that was a huge eye opener, just, uh, the general role of what we were doing and what was involved in the awarenesses. Um, when did the weight of the job take over? Because the decisions you make around that council table, as much as they may not seem big in the grand schemes of what's going on federally or what's going on provincially, they have direct impact on the residents of your community. When did that moment for you sort of click in and say, okay, the decisions I'm making are impacting my family, my neighbors, people I don't know, but are in my community. Um, oddly, that was an awareness I had of the role. Okay. I, I, I kind of knew that. And that's one of the things that maybe drew me in. One of those final things of that I could make a difference for the people in this community because my decisions would be impactful. Has it been challenging to understand that? Because now you're, because with everything going on in the world right now, the role of a counselor is the closest to the people. You don't go to Queens Park to do your job. You don't go to Ottawa to do your job. You're in your community 24, seven, seven days a week, 365 days a year. You make a decision, you're in the grocery store, you're at your business the next day. Has that sort of been a, a wake up call to say, okay, as much as I thought I knew what was going on in the community, and you, you say you you knew, now that the decisions I make, I have to be aware that the decisions I make, I'm going to hear about it the day after, <laughs> the moment after right. I make it, people are going to possibly stop me and ask me why you voted that way. Yeah, and and again, oddly, I was a little prepared for that, so. Um, just a little context, like I am um, part of what I do. I, I, I own a business in town and at my business, I'm very vocal about certain things. Um, with my nursing background, I was very vocal that I will be honoring, let's say, vaccine mandates. This area, um, like other areas, but this area is a high area of um people that didn't want to do vaccines. Um, and so I heard lots about that. And I, and I would say, I understand your uh, decision, um, but these are the decisions I'm making for me with the best information I have. Another item similar where I had to deal with this sort of thing uh, because of my stance um, was that I am um, a huge community advocate advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusivity. And so um, my business had been attacked. Uh, we had a flag burned at our business and I was threatened. And um, again, when I got very vocal about, you know, human rights and this is how I feel and you don't have to feel that way, but this is how um, I feel. Um, I knew coming into uh politics that these would be this would be another issue that I would have to deal with and so I was really grateful 
um, to, to learn things like at AMO last year, um, that uh, all of our policies have to be siphoned through a human rights lens and um, those sorts of things. But I, I, I was prepared. I'm, I'm aware of the uh, polarities in some in some individuals' uh, beliefs in this area. So I was aware that I wouldn't be like 100% supported in all of my thoughts. And so I knew that there was that potential for receiving the, the letters and the comments and the stopping in the grocery store. And um, so I, I feel like um, before I got here, I could diplomatically um, share my thoughts and feelings about how I felt and uh, without necessarily criticizing others. And I think that's an important part of it that I understand that's what you're saying, but based on what uh, my principles are and the information I have, this is the way I feel. And that's an, a pretty uh, honest comment and a comment I use often. <laughs> okay, first off, there's a few things I need to unpack there. First off, I apologize that you had to go through what you went through with the burning of Thank the you. flag. With the it made international flag. news. <laughs> As a gay man, I appreciate it. I say thank you. And as someone who comes from rural Ontario, I know what you, I don't, I don't want to say I know what you went through, but growing up in a rural Ontario setting, I can tell you that what you got, I got as well, but I didn't get the burning. I got threats thrown at me all the time. So A, thank you. Thank you for standing up and for being a partner. That's my first statement. Thank I just want to get that off the bat. <laughs> Did not want this to be this type of show, but this is what the, <laughs> the great thing about this show. I never know where we're going to take it. Right. Second, and this is the most important part. You are a municipal counselor for the people of your community, not just the ones who voted for you, but for everyone. Mm -hmm. Now you were right. A hundred percent of the people are never going to agree with anything. A hundred percent of the people agree with. Right. I don't care who you are. That is never going to happen. How much stock do you have to put in yourself to say, as much as someone may disagree with me, as much as someone may vehemently oppose what I believe, as their elected official, even if they didn't vote for me, I have to give them respect enough to listen to their views or listen to what they have to say, but do it respectfully. I don't want a counselor to go into a meeting and get yelled at because I just don't think that's right. But if right. someone comes to you and respectfully opposes what you uh, you support, how important is it for you to listen to all sides and not just be ingrained and sort of entrenched into sort of your echo chamber that you may have around you? Yeah, hundred percent. And and um, gratefully, I have the background that I have and the training that I have that um, that it, it doesn't even bother me to respond in a respectful way. Like it's not work for me uh, in the sense that um, I have had people, for instance, I advocated for a pride crosswalk as a counselor. Um, and I had several people like we are rural uh, Tilsonburg and we have grown substantially and I'm sure we'll talk about that. Um, but the fact is, is I say to them, um, respectfully, I understand your decision and you can believe in any way you want. As a counselor, I have to follow a code of conduct, which says I cannot discriminate against any race, religion, gender, uh, sexuality, orientation, or otherwise. And usually they go, yeah, but, you know, it's taxpayer dollar. And I'll go, no. This is Oxford Pride paying for this crosswalk and we have an agreement with them and, and on and on. And so I, I feel like I've diffused conversations. I've diffused some where they didn't walk away the same way they came in at me. <laughs> they came in hard and left a little softer. <laughs> How do you do that? And I, and I, I, I asked that not just as the host of the show, we have municipal leaders from across this country who listen to the show. We have hopefully prospective candidates who want to potentially uh, run for council in the next few years, listen to this show. That seems all well and good. 
And I, 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 again, I did not expect this to be this type of show, but this is where we're going and I love it already. Um, <laughs> how do you, what advice would you give to someone who is about to go into the position you are in, who is under the same pressures that you are in when they're dealing with people who vehemently disagree with you? Uh, going in and neutralizing a situation like you do is quite a challenge and it is a artwork. How, what advice would you give to a fellow counselor who might be having these same issues right now? Well, I think, I think it's our job to listen to them. It doesn't mean we have to agree with them, but we also don't have to take it personal that we're not on the same page. I think we've seen this like bionically on steroids for the last few years with the pandemic of uh, no it's this it's this and nobody's walking away going I now believe like you believe <laughs> nobody's doing that <laughs> nobody's going oh my gosh thank you you're right I'm wrong nobody's doing that so I even like even with that have at it if you like if you don't want to get vaccinated don't get vaccinated if you don't believe in because of your religion or your upbringing or whatever, then don't believe it. That's, that's not my business. But what my business is, is a counselor to follow my code of conduct and I will not discriminate against anybody. I appreciate that. And thank you for that. Um, I, I want to talk about sort of the role of a counselor because you have some very tough decisions, as we've already talked about, that you have to make on a daily basis, on a weekly basis or a monthly basis, depending on when your council meetings are. And you have to have the best information that you can get from residents, from administration, from your own personal background, from your own personal investigations on the issues. But you have to make those decisions. After a year and a half, does making the tough choices get easier? Um, yeah, like, so I would say I struggled at first with that, um, idea that I want, I, or maybe I thought council worked together for the good of the town. <laughs> oh, for those who are watching this, listening to this right now. Oh, the sarcastic <laughs> laugh that Chris is giving the sarcastic laugh. <laughs> Like, like I was a little blown away that it wasn't more of a, like, Kumbaya. <laughs> yay, Kumbaya, <laughs> collaboration for the biggest and wonderful town of Tilsonburg. It, it, it was not. And um, I, I don't know if you can tell that I am a vocal, articulate woman, and I came in like that at my first meeting. And I think a lot of people were like, who the heck is this <laughs> Um, and, and then like within the months, like, yeah, I support a private crosswalk and so on. Like we need a DEI committee. We need this. And I think a lot of people went, who is she? Like, why is she here? So it was a little bit of a surprise for me that it isn't, uh, all kumbaya with council, but I learned this early and, um, uh, my goal, and I would have to, I, I honestly had to practice hard for the first several months. I'm at a much more place of ease now where my goal is policy procedure principle. And so I try and look at policies. I try and look at the procedures that, uh, you know, procedural bylaws. And I look at the principle of subjects. And so what for me, it's easy to listen to staff. To me, I find... And I, I'm sure there's counselors out there just going, who, again, who is this chick and why isn't she shutting up? But I don't, I don't necessarily love the whole voting for politics, like on a position of meaning. Um, if this subdivision doesn't want this new house built here or this new apartment building here, a lot of people go, well, they're, they're big voters. We better do what they ask. And then it goes through maybe it doesn't, we don't pass it and then it goes somewhere else and then it goes to tri tribunal and ends up costing the town $20,000 or whatever it is. I'm like, well, why not? Why why don't you want it here? Is it just because you don't want apartments by your house or because we're in a housing crisis or maybe we like, I, I like to ask those questions. So 
if the director of finance says, this is what we need to do, I go, oh, okay, that makes sense to me. Um, or I might ask questions about it. But I find the whole idea of a counselor um, thinking they know more than an expert in finance or that they know more than an engineer, I find that very um, interesting. I, I certainly do too. And it, it seems to be cropping up, not just in Ontario, but across Canada, this, that issue of counselors know best and administration should take the directions from administration, from council and not uh, anywhere else. So that's just my personal opinion, but that's here. Like Cause I'm not a trained accountant. I'm not a trained engineer. I'm not those things like, and then like, especially in rural uh, um, councils, like, you know, we have some counselors that, have grade school or high school education, or uh, maybe their farming background. And that's wonderful. It's wonderful to have those diverse um, thoughts at the table. I think those are wonderful for the wholesome conversation for a rural town or for whatever, whatever committee council, whatever you're on, it's good to have all those different um, people coming from different directions. But I'm not going to question uh, an engineer on, you know, a bridge plan. If they say this is the bridge plan, I go, okay, thank you. Because <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, the role of a municipal councillor since COVID-19, and I'm just, I'll be blunt here, and this is my opinion, not the councillors, but the role of the municipal councillor has changed a lot over the last few years. And I say that because municipalities are dealing with more issues than they were traditionally 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. And the role of the municipality seems to have not have changed to address the needs that are uh, facing their communities. When you're out talking to residents, are residents asking you questions about the jurisdictional role that municipalities play compared to the federal government, the provincial government, or even the uh, upper tier of government, Oxford County? Will they address issues that are only local issues, or will they talk to you about issues that are outside of the jurisdictional purview of a municipal councillor? Yeah, uh, it, for sure. Like, I didn't know who did what, <laughs> right? Like I'm just I I had to learn all that when I got on council, um, and definitely uh, we get those questions all the time. Um, How do you deal with that? Because you don't want to sound like you're blowing someone off by saying that's not my jurisdiction. Go talk to your county councillor. Go talk to your MPP. Go talk to your MP. They have come to you for a particular reason because, A, they might know you better than your, their county councillor or their MPP or MP. What do you do in that situation when someone comes to you with a jurisdictional issue that is not in your purview? And and I'm so glad you said that because that's a complaint I hear of a lot. Um, I. I don't know if I've heard it directed to me, but not just our council, but like of this level of council where they go, that's not us, that's them. That's not us, that's them. And um, I think that that is, it feels like a blow off to people when we say that. Um, and I learned that quickly. So for instance, I can give you an example of how I would do it. Uh, our town, like many towns, need doctors we need nurse practitioners we need primary health providers we have thousands of people without a private primary health uh, care provider so people could say well it's not us it's provincial like we could say that but i like to create positive solutions i like to be a part of positive solutions our um, town has a health care advisory committee which i am on uh, we um, are looking to hire a physician recruiter uh, we have put in proposals for nurse practitioner clinics. So that's how I reply. This is what we're doing. This is how I would say, it. well, we've got this going, we've got this going, this going. That being said, all of our funding comes from the province. So I would recommend if you'd like a little bit more to reach out to our MPP or to our provincial government. And that usually makes them feel like, okay, so you guys are doing a little bit, but ultimately you know, our hands are tied and I could go to here. That sort of thing. That's what I would like to do more. I wish, I wish we'd all do. Like even with homelessness, 
people go, that's not us. That's, that's somebody else that has to deal with it. And I'm like, well, we better start dealing with this because it's in our town and we need to make like, yeah, maybe not all the funding, but we could certainly do things to assist. Like, so, and we have, like, we've got a transitional house now. We've got a cold shelter. We need a day hub. I've heard there's an organization working on that, but ultimately we need funding. And, um, so again, I would like, I always share what we're doing at our level and then we need more. And so you can contact your MPP and your provincial government. <laughs> um, this, this, it's a good segue into segment two. And I want to talk about the town for a few minutes, if you don't mind, Councillor. But before I do this, I preface this first question in this segment all the time. This is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. This is the councillor's opinion and her opinion alone. She has one vote on council. Just want to make sure I say that. So, <laughs> councillor, with that rant done, um, what do you see as the biggest issue or issues facing the town of Tilsonburg today as of recording this episode? Yeah, so we're 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 on the map, man. <laughs> we're like a little town at Tilsonburg. We're the second fastest growing um uh place in Ontario. No, in Canada, the first in Ontario. And so we had a 17% growth increase oh. from I think 2017 to 2022. It was massive. And we had um, that has created all kinds of issues. And and I think for me and one of my feelings and the term I use is responsible growth, because we are faced with we had this massive population increase and we didn't really play catch up as fast as we should have. It might have been problematic because a lot of it was during the pandemic. Um, and so we lack stores, we lack um, facilities uh, or programs. For instance, um, our swimming lessons, they, they get announced, we're open for swimming lesson registration. They sell out in an hour and people are on a six month waiting list. So we don't have the structure, infrastructure, the programs, the facilities, the stores, the medicine, the medical doctors to deal with this. And we're we're getting there. So the last couple of years, we've been playing catch up. We've hit that 20,000 magic numbers, what they say, a population of 20,000. We'll start to get some of the bigger stores in. But the fact is, is that we don't have a lot of the things in place that we need to, in my opinion. <laughs> so um, I'm going to ask the million dollar follow up question to that, because I think this is an important conversation we're having right now. What steps does Tilsonburg and you as a counselor and as a council need to do to take to address these issues? Because you're talking about the growth and the uh, growth outpacing the need, the sort of the demand that is there right now. But right. We're in a complete housing crisis across this country right now. So what do you see as your role as counselor to address some of these issues that you've just talked about to make sure that Tilsonburg continues to grow, continues to adapt, but also uh, becomes a place where people continue to want to move? Right. So in in regards to housing, and I just I was just pulling it up on my phone here, Um <laughs> realtor.ca you know everybody knows realtor.ca yeah. <laughs> just put out a um a blog on the five canadian communities where home sales soared and tilsonburg is the number one in canada isn't that bizarre so we're the highest sales growth percentage as of october 2023 compared to 2022 and it's um yeah so we're 11.8 percent sales growth and the next highest is a um, city in alberta and it's 2.5 wow 
I so, know, right? So, so what do you have to do then to address some of these issues? Because home prices, as much as we might think that they're going to come down sometime tomorrow or next week or week from now, it's not. I don't, I'm going to burst everyone's bubble in 2024. <laughs> the housing prices are not going to magically just disappear and they're going to come back down to pre-pandemic levels. What do you see your role as council and what can council do in the short term to address some of these uh, issues? So um, our council does have a affordable housing um, accessibility committee, um, but we have, as everywhere, a lot of nimbyism. And so <laughs> say it ain't have... so, counselor. You would never <laughs> say that nimbyism is alive and well in Canada in twenty twenty four. Right, like like a lot. <laughs> and so we have to we have to call it out. I, in my opinion, we have to call it out. I understand you don't want this, but we're in a housing crisis. We have people that can't afford a place to live. Our homelessness rate has soared. Um, you know, I and the ripple effect of this. So um again at, at AMO last year, we learned that um usually if somebody is uh, gets homeless within like within a week, there is the formation of mental health problems and addiction. It's just the culture of the street. And so there's ripple effect of hurt for individuals and our community happens. We have to address this. It's going, in my opinion, it'll get worse before it gets better. There's a lot of people on the cusp um, of uh, housing insecurity, food insecurities. Our rates have gone high, sky high in the amount of people looking at our food bank to use. Um, we just had a delegation with the multi-service center in town, 130%, um, I think, don't quote me on that. It was over 100% increase in people using Meals on Wheels. Um, it, it's we have we have to uh, address this, and um, you know, at the same time of addressing the problems that the housing crisis has caused, in my opinion. And I, I've heard this before. Well, that's not ours. That's provincial. <laughs> and I'm like, this is in our town. Our businesses are concerned. Our our people in our community are concerned that if we don't do something, but then there's another group of people saying, no more development, no more housing. And I get that. And and sometimes our hands are tied and like, you know, well, we can't, we can ask them. And, and we are starting to see more where a developer will say, okay, we're putting in a four story apartment here and we wanna make this amount of units as affordable housing between 900 and $1,200 or something, because you can't find that anywhere in our town. And so we have to go, oh, oh, thank you. Yes, please. And approve these things. But we've got other people going, we don't want that here. Like literally saying those words, we don't want that in our backyard. <laughs> God bless NIMBYism. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about another issue you talked about briefly, but I want to dig into it because I think this is an area that you are passionate about because your background. I want to talk about doctor recruitment because you said that this is a concern in 2024, you say that more people in Tilsonburg do not have access to a family doctor. What do you do at, on your boards that you sit on through as counsel, as a counselor, to look at attracting new doctors, new nurse practitioners, new GPs to your area? Because every other community is under the same issue right now. And I don't care where you are, whether it be Toronto, all the way up to Thunder Bay, to Tilsonburg, all the way up to Russell, you're facing these issues. What does Tilsonburg have to do to stand above the rest to sort of attract those doctors? Um, well, I think... Uh, and what are you doing, I should say? Okay, yeah. So we have our uh, healthcare advisory committee. On that, we have three um, FRO doctors, the FRO doctors. We also have the executive director of a nurse practitioner clinic in Ingersoll, which is about 20 minutes away from Tilsonburg. We have the president of uh, the hospital, which is a duo CEO of Tilsonburg and Ingersoll Hospital. 
And uh, we, I think, and this is from um, the chair of the committee that's been doing this for years, this is the year we've made the most headway. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Well, you weren't there beforehand. I'm just I was there. <laughs> guys do the math. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, we've made headway in the sense that we're hiring a physician recruiter. We've talked to all the different models of healthcare, come in and have them speak to us. And the fact is, is that physicians are looking for change in the models that they did. Um, a lot of the um, physicians that we have in Tulsenburg, and we have. I think a couple at least in the next few years retiring, which adds to this <laughs> feeling of nobody's got health care. Um, that um, they worked to the bone and they took on 5,000 patients each and they worked long hours. And, you know, some of them I know would like go to somebody's house after work because it was a small town feel. And a lot of the doctors and having worked at a teaching hospital, I get this, want that wraparound approach where um, within your facility, you can talk to a, um, you know, a psychologist or a nutritionist or a nurse practitioner or social worker or, 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 and um, have that wrap around um, holistic approach to healthcare, and and that's what we're hearing is they want more of that. Um, so we've also applied for a nurse practitioner clinic uh, last year uh, when some funding came available with the Ministry of Health. Uh, we have not uh, received that yet or that approval, but um, we're hoping uh, we have Roma coming up next weekend, and we're hoping that that will. Uh, uh, maybe put some more positive pressure for our area because we are unique in the sense that the nurse practitioner clinic that is well run, well run, and does some work with some of the social service stuff like uh, homeless people, checkups, have a free shower, that sort of thing. They're willing to open a second office. So we're not reinventing the wheel. We're taking what they've got with their executive director and opening another one. Hopefully you, that's helpful. You've talked about two very big macro issues, healthcare, housing. These are two very big issues. But if I go to Tilsonburg tomorrow and I ask 100 people in the downtown core and I say, hey, guys, what's the biggest issue you're facing in your community today? They're going to give me a plethora, a plethora of issues, potholes, parks, need new service levels. How do you balance the needs and understandings of where the community needs to go, whether it be addressing housings, with the addressing of the individual issues? Because individual issues are here and now. They want results today. How do you see yourself balancing what people want with what the community wants? Basically, I'm quoting Star Trek here for any Star Trek. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. So how do you, how do you balance the needs of the many with the needs I of the one? I can't do it. <laughs> exactly. So how do you do that? Because I can imagine that is the tricky part of being a counselor because you want to solve all the issues, but you know, at the end of the day, you only have a limited supply of money and you are not going to be able to address all the issues every year. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I like, like I'm, um, and, and, and I don't, I, I, I pretty sure not everybody loves how engaged I am on social media. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I ask those things all the time. Like, you know, for new year's, I said, Hey, it's 2024. Uh, I like to put out wish lists for my year and for the town, I want a nurse practitioner clinic and a winner's clothing store. <laughs> and I and the the and I share it to social media groups, not just on my page. And I I hear from everybody, so I try and get that feel for what the needs of many are. Um, number one, I would say in our town is a cheaper grocery store. Is that what is what we hear? But then, um, so I try and move with that. I try and keep as engaged as I can. Um, I always encourage people to reach out and tell me these things, talk to me, and then I try and represent that. Um, is it hard to say no in your job? Um, I can't even think of an example where I, I, 
Well, hypothetically, if someone came up to you, and this is all hypothetical right now, because I'm not sure every single interaction you've ever had, but if someone comes up to you tomorrow and says, hey, I want a new pool. I want an indoor pool, heat it with a big giant sauna, because I don't think the one that we have is currently adequate. You know that is a $20, $40 million expenditure that not a lot of people are willing to app, uh, sort of dish out right now. So you have to look at every individual as a individual basis and say, okay, can we do it? Is it affordable? And sort of those three P principles that you were talking about, policy, procedure, and practice uh, at the beginning of the interview, you have to go through that sort of checklist and say, okay, is this plausible for our community? So I don't know if you were uh, you knew or if that was an intuitive vibe you felt, but we're literally right now doing our indoor pool renovations. It's not <laughs> like I do research on my guests right before the show, but hypothetically, if so, someone said, um, hey, you need to do a said, pool upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> that being said, we are uh, in the midst of doing a strategic plan. And uh, for our parks, parks, culture rack, like a, I think it's 10 year or 25 year. And so when people inquire to me like that, um, again, I depend on the experts. So what I do, like, let's say I got an email that said, hey, like I have recently, how long is this new pool going to take? Why isn't it done? I'm tired of going out of town swimming. I say, thank you very much for your email. I have forwarded this to the head of director of the Parks, Culture and Rec, and they'll be able to give you more information than I could. And that's what I do because I don't know what else uh, to say. Like, certainly if it was something that people keep bringing to the table, I would bring it up um, and bring it forth for council deliberation. Um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if that answered your question. It, it does. So I want, because I get accused on this show because uh, yes, sometimes the host does get accused of things. I get accused <laughs> on the show of only talking about negative things in municipalities in the first two segments. So I'm going to throw it a little bit of a curveball on this question. I'm going to ask you, what does Tilsonburg get right? What is the thing you boast about? So you're about to go to Roma, the Rural Ontario Municipalities Association, and you're going to go speak with other municipal leaders from across Ontario. What are you going to be talking about? What are you going to say? Well, you guys do it right, but we do it better. What's the thing that you guys in your community do well? Um. Well, <laughs> our, our downtown BIA is um, known through Ontario. Um, and it is, a uh, part of councils and, and so I will take some of their <laughs> glory, <laughs> but we've had real estate agents tell us people move to town because our downtown is so good. These guys, uh, and I shouldn't say guys, men and women get up early in the morning. They clean up anything from that might be paraphernalia or excrement from, um, you know, those suffering from addiction or suffering from being houseless. They do it early in the morning. They are picking weeds. They're sweeping. People love our downtown. It's nice. We have, we're a small town, but we have it all. We have two golf courses. We have a curling club. We have two hockey and ring out arenas. We have a Olympic sized pool. We have an outdoor water park. We have lots of base, like we're very uh, oriented um, to parks and rec. Um, we, we were always known as a sports town. So we have those sorts of things. We have one of the highest populations of retirement in this town. 30% of our population is senior citizens. Because we built these two, or we didn't, a developer built two um, uh, senior communities in this town. People move from all over to come to this because of the golf courses, because it's um, 25 minutes to the lake, 35 minutes to the city. It's a nice location. And that's actually what that uh, realtor.com or .ca website says. This town has it all. And they're centrally located, so you get a small town feel, but you can zip to the city at any time, or you can just drive down to the lake for an evening ice, ice cream cone. <laughs> um, 
while we're talking about the community, I want to turn to my last segment because this is my favorite segment, and that is tourism. I don't think, and this is my opinion, I don't think municipalities boast about their tourist destinations enough. And this is the part of the show where we get to do that a little bit here. So as someone who's about to come through Tilsonburg in 2024 in the summer, what tourist destinations should I and people who are listening and watching this right now stop and see while in the great town of Tilsonburg? Yeah, well, I'm 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 a arts person in the sense that um, I I wouldn't consider myself artistic, but I love arts. So I love live anything live. <laughs> I I just imagine it going back to the old school where we just sat around like old 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 school where we sat around fires and told stories and acted out and sang and did plays and that sort of thing. And this town has it. We have a station arts center. We have a heritage museum that is just gorgeous. Uh, we have a theater um, and, and several theaters nearby. Um, our downtown is beautiful. And we have several uh, facility, not facilities, businesses that would um, freak, uh, that frequently have live music um, at their place. Um, I don't know if it's inappropriate for me to toot my own horn, but my business is really fun. <laughs> and we just won an Ontario Tourism Culinary DEI Award at my business. So that's probably not appropriate to toot my horn as a business person. But um, there are businesses like mine that uh, celebrate and and um, are celebrated by tourism. Um well, I congratulations on that award, but Thanks. I've got I've got to ask the sort of the follow up question because I'm going to sort of ask you to basically to pick your favorite child in the community a little bit here. <laughs> Where's your go to spot? Where's your spot in the community that you can go and decompress after a long day of work, after a long day of council meetings? What's the getaway spot for Kelly? What's the spot in the community that you can go decompress? knowing that tomorrow morning you're going to be back at it again, solving the issues that are facing your community? Um, I have four, if I can say four, save, can I have four? I don't like, you, can, you can have as I many, don't like many the favorite choice you're making me do here. <laughs> okay. Four it is. Go for it. Uh, we have a movie theater. I love going to a movie uh, because I don't work. I'm in the dark. Nobody talks to me. It's my quiet time just to take in something. Um, we have the mill, uh, which is the old oatmeal mill by our founder, E.D. Tilson of Tilsonburg. And we have a businessman that has made this mill into a gem. Good food, but he's just introduced an underground pub where they have live music and open mic nights. And he brings in like um, music from, um, you know, Toronto and like, it, it's just, it's a really nice little gem and it's right on the Otter Creek. Um, what was my third? Oh, Lake Lisger. So I haven't even said anything about Lake Lisger. We got this lake in the middle of our town and I've lived around this lake my whole life and it's my go-to spot to walk. So walking around the town, um, you're know, walking around the lake, there's a bridge, um, it's near our uh, parks uh, facility, our, our community center, and it, it, and we have a, a committee in town that works on this, a volunteer committee that works on the aeration of this uh, pond and the health of this pond, and it, it's a little gem right in the middle of town, but it's a really, there's a fountain there and a gazebo. and Sounds delicious. You said four. That's only three there, Kelly. So what's the right. fourth one? Or is that like a <laughs> hidden, hidden one? You don't even want to tell me. <laughs> no, there's a pub in town, the Copper Mug. It's been around forever. It's changed names. It's changed uh, uh, owners. And um, it's a fun pub in town to see people. And they have all kinds of really fun nights where they do music trivia nights and live music and uh yeah, it's just a fun place to unwind with friends. Um, Councillor, so we started this conversation talking about yourself. We're ending this conversation talking about the town of Tilsonburg. So I've got to ask the million dollar question to end this interview. And it's the most important question. I think every municipal leader knows how to answer it, though. But it's always great to hear it from themselves. 
What makes the town of Tilsonburg such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Right. And it, isn't it interesting? Because I was like in high school, I can't wait to get out of this town, this little silly town. And then I went away and I lived away. And then I was like, huh, I have time to have kids. Let's move back to Tilsonburg. <laughs> And so for me, I think that uh, it's just got it all. It's got a small town feel, but it's got all the uh, things you'd want to have uh, to do. Um, yeah, I uh, we were uh, I, in McLean's Magazine in the top um, 25 places to work remotely. Um, we have become uh, more diverse uh, and and. And for me, this is a good thing. We have a lot of people that have moved from the city. And from my experience, the more diversity a town has, the better it is. And more mines, more um, like we've got like Indian food restaurants now. And so we've got this small town feel. We've got a um, Japanese Korean sushi place. And so traditionally a small town wouldn't have the, that those sort of things you'd have to go to the city to get Indian food or whatever and now we've got it all I, I honestly I, I love this town I think we have it really well it's not too big in my opinion but it's big enough to have the things that I want <laughs> counselor I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart um doing these interviews has just been an eye-opening experience learning about so many great communities but all the great people who are serving their communities i truly want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for stepping up serving but also coming on this show and talking about tilsonburg and yourself it's always a pleasure to chat with people like yourself who seem to be such great cheerleaders for their communities so thank you so much yeah it's been a pleasure and now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth interviews on the cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we're your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed and engaged. Your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to love. Now, if you can, please consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.